Hello horror fans and welcome to another episode of Silver Screams. Tonight we are talking to you about Scream Queens Season 1, the penultimate episode, Black Whose number Friday. number we don't know. I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. So, Black Friday, uh, which was a great follow-up to Thanksgiving because I don't know if anybody knows this about me, but I hate Black Friday. So, I really very much appreciated this opening that showed was both like a zombie mall scenario. It really scenario. was a zombie apocalypse sort of thing. They, they framed it and they edited it in such a fashion that the hordes of shoppers were very much the zombies. But at the same time, showed how awful Chanel was by taunting them. That, like, again, if zombies were sentient, that would be like somebody like dangling Here's barbecue a Here's a in front of them. Here's the only steak left. And I'm eating it. I'm a person. What? No. So, yeah, I, I very much appreciate anything that's willing to lampoon and highlight the stupidity of Black Friday and how ridiculous it is. That's just me. I, I know a lot of people love it. I don't get it. Do it's you... kind of going the way of the dodo, actually, partially because of Cyber Monday and partially because people have gotten wise to the fact that Black Friday deals aren't actually all that good. Like, they jack the price up. And then they lower it, so it looks like it's dramatic price reduction when really it's like 5% of normal. So you're not really better off. You know, I would never have guessed that it's actually going away because the... But I guess like I, there is a sense of desperation on the part of the retail companies for making it earlier and earlier and offering it on Thanksgiving. I guess trying to make it seem like it's a bigger deal than it actually is. And I don't... you have... Was it REI that did the thing where they said, we're paying all of our employees on Black Friday. All of our stores are closed. We encourage everyone to go outside. And of course, I was in families, Colorado and it was nine degrees. So we Maybe not outside, just outside of our store. REI just, did specifically say outside, but they're, I, I think it's REI. It was REI or North Face or someone that's really known for the outdoor clothing and the stuff like North that. North Face. <laughs> that's an awesome name for a company. It's a thing. That's hilarious. But there, it was one of those companies where the CEO straight up said, we're paying all of our employees vacation day. We're closing all of our stores. Go outside. Spend time outside of a department store. That's a message I can get behind. But, strangely enough, it's Black Friday shopping that teaches Chanel momentarily the true meaning of friendship. We were talking about this earlier. You were yeah. saying she's just so easily swayed. Um, she really is. She tends to forget that she has this moral side to her. Until someone gives her some form of reality check, whether it be, no, you're a terrible, you're, you're not trying to make a house better, you are recreating the situation you have at home, or whether it be, we got this for you because it's Christmas and we care. Like, it requires a reality check yeah, whether to it's, snap her back whether into... Whether it's Denise going, everybody has a terrible mom, you don't, but you don't say that. You yeah. know, you don't ever say somebody else's mom is terrible. Or whether it's seeing Hester get berated by a group of even more awful people. Yeah, I didn't think that was possible. And then we met Chad's family. Like, <laughs> so but, even Muffy. But yeah, even though even though Chanel box at the gift itself, the the notion of Chanel number five shrugging and smiling and going, because it's Christmas, it touches whatever facet of her heart is still left and she just wants to shower them with gifts because that's the only way she knows how to give positive reinforcement is by buying somebody something well and she'd only previously on black friday she'd specifically picked out terrible cheap gifts for the chanel's to make them question their friendship but still kind of keep their loyalty and so then that it was herself, easier to manipulate them and yeah. then bought herself something ridiculously nice and here she was picking out cheap gifts in front of them for them and that's when this conversation happened yeah and so it's and again the the gift itself that they got her is something she already has in terms of like having access to actual chanel apparel it's thirteen thousand dollars yeah, I love my friends. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'd ever spend $13,000 on anybody. Well, with the exception of Hester, I think all the Chanel's are ridiculously oh, yeah, freaking no. rich. They're, they're all ridiculously wealthy. But 
it again, it's just the notion of like it's Christmas, like it's the thought that counts, yeah. and that triggering some iota of humanity left in her is very sweet for the two seconds that it lasts before the killer shows up. Well, and they've also earlier in the episode essentially. Is that when they accused Dean Munch of being killer at that point? Or was, or was yes. Chanel just giving her shade about, you tried to shut us down, and it's your university shut down, and your career in the toilet, and we're going shopping. It's that first one. It's the, you can't stop us. Like, yeah. you couldn't, you can't protect us. <clears throat> your university shut down, but Kappa House is stronger than ever. You can't stop us. This is what we're doing. Chanel Oberlin out. Pretty much. So, yeah, it's, so when they're confronted with the Red Devil surprisingly chanel tries to make a stand which is fascinating to go like to see her actually own up and take responsibility because she am kappa president because she thinks that this is dean munch who's coming at her with a crossbow which is so funny because later on when she's actually confronted with dean munch towards the end of the episode she's paralyzed with fear so it's an interesting parallel while the person is still wearing the mask and they're just an idea, I suppose, even if they think it's Dean Munch. She still has the ability to stand up, berate them, and even after getting shot with a crossbow, still saying, come at me, bro. I think there's a difference between, you know, her standing up and saying, no, I have my pride, I'm going to make a stand, and going, we're going to kill her, here's the plan. Fair enough. Because and then having nobody show up to that plan. Because there's no malice afoot for Chanel for the first one. She's still in the throes of goodwill, such as it is, such as it is with her. She flips it on and off like a switch. And so you can find a lot of courage in that. But it's, no, we're going to kill her, even though she has proven unkillable by other means so far. Nothing is working out as planned. Crap, 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 crap. Yeah, no. So big difference. Yeah, there's a huge difference there. And uh, as we we find out later on in the episode, but we, we get the first hint of, here, the entire police force has been fired for incompetence. Well, and, yeah. Yeah, um, again, understandably so, because they spent so much time and money uh, investigating the paranormal side of things. The ghost hunting. Bit. Yeah. The month's budget on that ghost hunting. Denise, of all people, has been promoted to the chief of police, which, don't get me wrong, I think she's a fascinating character, and... I find that every now and then when she does drop a truth bomb, you know, it is filled with little pearls of wisdom. But really? <laughs> she still thinks Zayday's the killer. She still thinks Zayday's the killer. Like, at this point, you just gotta let it go. And, again, Holy she's God. also the type of person who, when there's a serial killer after these girls, thinks that telling scary stories is the best medicine. Like... When there's a serial killer in the house, her priorities are a little askew. She's still alive, though. Good for her. And she also making straight monologued in for a little bit instead of shooting the Red Devil when she had him dead to rights. And then the Red Devil shot one of her uh, deputies with a crossbow and pulled the tree oh, down in man, the mall. Man, I should have got him when I had the chance. It was just one of those moments of, well. Yeah, and you but can just, we live in a Ryan Murphy world where competence is fleeting and the jokes are everything. You you can just see it on Chanel's face, too. She's got the crossbow arrow sticking out of her, and she's just like, oh, why? She's, she's, you have a gun? Like, oh, boy. That doesn't seem Your safe. Your life just got more difficult. That doesn't seem safe in any capacity. Um, but, yeah, so we, we do find out more about the police uh, because Pete and Grace and... Um, Grace's dad decided to go and report Gigi's death to the police, and again, they kind of reach a dead end because they realize that there yeah. are there is no police left, which it's bad for the town. It's not just bad for Kappa House. It's bad for the town having no cops. Although honestly, the Kappa House has been such a lightning rod for murder, and there has been the murderer running around. I would be really surprised if many, if any, other crimes were being committed in the town. It's like, I could go do some petty theft, or I could popcorn dot gif at other people's murderous misfortune. I don't know. People are opportunists. That's true. Anywho, but that's not our concern. Our concern is Kappa House. And Kappa House has this little powwow meeting where they decide that Dean Munch most certainly is the killer. And even Grace, of all people, supports Chanel's painkiller-induced idea that killing Dean Munch is the best thing to do, even though all the evidence is circumstantial. 
And it's funny seeing Zayday the reverse. Zayday does not, right? Yeah. Zayday yeah. does not. And it's only when Grace changes her mind and thinks that they need something more concrete and that they shouldn't kill Dean Munch. That's when Zayday flips and goes, sorry, no. like You were right the first time. You were time. right the first time. And so it's an interesting dilemma because you see both sides of it. If they are 100% sure that Dean Munch is the killer, they've been dropping like flies. So you can understand where they're coming from in terms of, and granted, she is a murderer. She did kill her ex-husband. So yeah. they're, you know, let's not pretend she's not a horrible person. She she is. She's but a Chanel murderer. But and Grace have both been so sure that other, like for a while, Grace thought her dad was a murderer and Chanel was accusing number five and accusing just... And accused Grace and Zayday and at one point yeah. thought that they should kill Grace and Zayday. So if, Chanel is really not the best uh, judgment here. But, but it was it was very sweet when it. when they both uh, said that they should poison her. She uh, poison her. Oh, and I'm like friendship. I'm like oh, honey, and but then it, it <laughs> pufferfish venom is what they use, and it does not work. And again, I I. T- like they they keep trying these different things. Uh, they tried the cryo chamber after that, after the poison didn't work, and, and she's fine. And she's fine. And I love that they brought up the Himalayan monk again, um, because that seems to be how she's Houdiniing her way out of death, or she's just lucky, she, or she's just one of those people where it happens. I I honestly think she's that the Putin. the venom thing is. Either something that she also developed while studying with the monk was like an immunity to iocane powder, that sort of thing. Or it's gross incompetence on the Chanel's parts because where on God's green earth did they get pufferfish on? Hester. Um, Point, but, but still gross incompetence. It could be gross incompetence. It could, and it could also be, and I think we get this more and more, is that the dean is just stupid like a fox. In terms of, she's not an idiot. She knows exactly what Chanel and her cronies are doing. Like, there's no way she doesn't know, uh, you know, what they mean when they pass her her favorite drink and say they want to create a feminist collective. Like, there's no way she doesn't know that they're up to something. Yeah. So either she's actively, either she's just the type of person that just, like, poison doesn't work on her, or she's like actively preparing for attempts on her life. And honestly, I wouldn't put that past her because she thought out the whole murder of her ex-husband thing pretty, pretty well. With the exception of the soul fights thing, which fell through. Yeah. And the Red Devil, Zuh, and Justice Scalia have gone after her before. So she's obviously not off the And top she of the saw ball. that movie 50 times. And, and yeah, so that's, that's another thing, is we've seen what happens to people who try to kill Dean Munch. They get their asses they kicked. They get their asses handed they to them. They get destroyed. They do. So it honestly doesn't wouldn't surprise me in any way, shape, or form if she can spot an attempt on her life coming a mile away and can act accordingly, as we saw with Justice Scalia and the Red Devils. But So we um, have two attempts on her life that go through all the way through and nothing happens and a third where chanel asks all the other chanels to back her up and they just miss the call they get distracted and And so she's stuck holding a bag of chains at the pool with um dean munch talking to her like why are we meeting at the pool why are you carrying a bag full of chains do you think no one's here because there's a serial killer on the loose and the campus has been evacuated like Dean Munch knows. There's Why no way she are we here, Chanel? Right. And she just walks away. And... There's no way she doesn't know. Yeah, there's no way she doesn't know. It, like, at the very least, by this particular oh, yeah. instance. Oh. I, again, I, I think that she knew what was up the first time around. But, like, at the very least, by the third time, she knows what's up. And that being said, we've... I don't think she is the other Red no. Devil killer. No. They've made it pretty apparent that Pete in this episode, maybe not necessarily being the Red Devil killer, but is certainly involved to a certain extent because he is Boone's sole beneficiary of his will. 
Uh, and including the box of lubes under his bed, which is like that is an awkward. Were thing you right secret in your lovers? Will, buddy. Weird, weird. And then we're Chad... talking bad about Dead Gay Bone. And then Chad Funny. challenging him to a duel because he refused, ex- like joining the the Dicky Dollar Scholars. I which honestly is think that Pete is. And I know the season finale has aired at this point. Please don't leave spoilers in the comments. We haven't had the opportunity to watch it yet. But I'm waiting for that to come back around and for him to either take out Pete or take out the last Red Devil. Just because you're going to die. You're going to get murdered to death. Choose your weapon. And then I feel like this is the sort of thing that Chad Radwell does not let go. Especially since he is the last standing Dickie Dollar Scholar. These traditions live and die with him. And and he brings up a very good point in in terms of actually something that I kind of forgot about that was mentioned at the beginning of the season was that Pete had a thing for Chanel for a while. That's right. He stalked her for a while. He stalked her for a while. um, And we learn here that he was actually initially denied admittance to the Dickey Dollar Scholars. Because he doesn't know anything about golf and doesn't have a sweet Abertine and doesn't have any John Mayer albums. All those other... Seemingly arbitrary... Well, well, the golf is a big thing because that's what it's... The golf is an actual thing. Like, fair enough with the golf, but all that other stuff But the other other two are just like... Thank you, Chad. Whatever. And like, it's so funny because I didn't even think of it as like a golf club, even though that's all they do. A golf club. Get out. <laughs> but I didn't think of it as a golf club. I thought of it as a fraternity. Like, yes. because they, Six they treated it like a fraternity. They all live together. It is a Greek organization of some sort. I but feel it's just like really it's... weird that it's more like an intramural sports thing than it is... A fraternity, and maybe it's like one part golf club and one part fraternity. I don't, I don't know. I'm not gonna pretend to know. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Or I guess maybe it's just a collective of people who are there on golf scholarships. No, because they're all super freaking rich. Yeah, they're all rich, but again, all, all golf play? oriented. Yeah, true. Anyway, like, anyway, he Chad would totally is... use a scholarship even if he didn't need it. Anyway. Chad is the last okay. of the Dickie Dollar Scholars. We need Earl Grey to read the minutes. Oh, right. He's dead. He's dead. But, um... It's just like, oh, I miss and that, Earl Grey. And that is a bummer. That is, you know, again, Earl Grey was a good man, even though I suspected him of being a murderer. He was a good side murderer. character. He, like, I suspected him of being a murderer for a long time. But anyway, we, we see that Pete had resentment towards the Greek system even before Chanel turned him down, that it's possible he started pursuing Chanel in an attempt to kind of undermine Chad, in a way, and his organization, and that's where he developed this strong hatred, which he brings up to Grace in kind of a cryptic moment of him just kind of staring off in the middle of a tirade and saying how the system should be cleaned up and maybe the Red Devil was the one to do it. Uh, well, and all this stuff about, you know, the Greek system perpetuates all these awful things in this awful standing order. and It's antiquated. It's misogynistic, which all you have to do is turn on the news to any given, like, story about a fraternity, and you can see that there is legitimate... There is legitimacy to that to an extent. But it's also a lot of the things that get publicized. Like, I honestly think it depends on the location, the one that you're... Like... I'm, I'm a Gamify, and I was a Gamify at Pepperdine, and we were a more service-oriented um, sorority. We, we weren't the partiers on campus. That was a different chapter. And talking with my mom, who went to Oregon, evidently the Gamifies at Oregon are real woo girls. And it's woo. the same sorority, different chapters, same overarching organization, and it just develops differently depending on the people who are in it, the location. The, I mean, Pepperdine is a religious college, the purpose, service, leadership. Y- you know, well, Oregon's not. I would actually debate that at least when it comes to fraternities. Like, I, I will say that even if fraternities do a lot of good stuff, they are still boys clubs. That's true, Every too. single one of them. So even the quote-unquote good fraternities, maybe without even meaning to, do perpetuate unintentionally certain ideals 
And I, I will say that I, I was a sociology major, and one of my classes talked about a particular case study with fraternities. And my professor for that went to school at Pepperdine, which was, or he went to school at like some very Christian college. And there were elements of the things in that case study even in his fraternity, and that was one of the good ones. So, like, in just the way that, like, again, I don't know if it's, like, just a dude-to-dude thing. If any large groups of college students have the propensity to do some incredibly dumb stuff. Point being, I still think fraternities and sororities are dumb. That's just me. And that's your thing. And that's my thing. And we also have these very exaggerated versions that we're seeing oh, yeah, in Scream no. Queens. Ryan because, Murphy. again, we live in a Ryan Murphy world in this series. And a lot of what happened in this series would not be possible if it weren't a Ryan Murphy world. The very existence of some of the Chanel's wouldn't be possible. Ryan Murphy world. Real talk, though. If you're in a fraternity or sorority, just be cool. Yeah, that's all it takes. Just be yeah. cool. Anywho... To get kind of back to Pete, uh, <laughs> to get back to Pete, uh, he r- decides he's going to leave campus. He's just going to freaking bolt, and he gets a call, presumably from the other killer. Yeah, the Red Devil. And this is where we find out that, at, first of all, that Boone was his source of information for a lot of the elements of his story, uh, that Gigi was actually the sister of... Uh, one of the girls in Kappa House who was there that night who tried to raise the twins on her own and committed suicide because of the stress and that Gigi's whole deal was just getting, she had a nervous breakdown based on that and has spent the last 20 years. Yeah, that was the traumatic event. She wasn't at Kappa House at the time. We all assumed that she was there that night. No, her sister was. And that she has raised these two children to get revenge and that the sister that is left is the one taking revenge into her own hands yes. and that she seemingly reached out to Pete for help and he may or may not have participated in the murders with her which would explain why I say at the mall Hester can point to the red devil and make her escape So all this time we thought we were working with two Red Devils, and then it turned into three, and now it's four. At least. At least. So, turns out everyone's a Red Devil. Well, I mean, we kind of threw that out as a possibility. Uh, And again, it would explain why Pete has been MIA for a lot of things where all of the Kappa girls were around. So again, it would explain, and again, if it is Hester, which I still think it is, I may be wrong, given that the finale aired. Um, but Again, no spoilers, please. <laughs> no spoilers, please. But given that the finale ended, I, I, feel, I still feel like it's probably Hester. Uh, and again, recruiting him would make sense because it takes a lot of upper body strength and heavy lifting if you're going to be doing that sort of physicality, like wielding chainsaws and wielding axes and just generally chasing people around a hedge maze, that is a lot to ask of somebody who has a neck brace and who has physical issues with that sort of thing. It would be interesting, once we find out who the final killer is, if it is Hester, to go back and rewatch the series and try to figure out who's under the mask in at any, any given, given point. Because if there's a red devil that doesn't turn their head, that's a thought. Well, and again, the red devil has very dynamic movements and very distinct, deliberate. So yes, if there and does always seem to be standing prim and proper. Yeah, you know that sort of thing with great posture, and that of course is given the actor that is in the Rev Devil suit, who is not actually the same character. But there's also plastic chest plates. So, yes. Uh, but the, anyway, that's the way the Red Devil moves. And again, it would make sense if there is a neck brace under there, um, just given very deliberate steps, very methodical way of moving around. It's the fast moving stuff that makes me go, I don't know if you can pull that off when just standing without your neck brace is really, really difficult and painful. Well, that's what she says. 
That's what she says. She very well could just be fine and just be lying about the we neck brace thing the know. whole time. Yeah. Or have been cured at one point, like she postulated, or, you know, when we find out that she wasn't dead. Uh, that being said, I still think it's Hester, and I don't think Pete is going to make it out of this okay. No, I, I, I again, we um, put the Dickie Dollar Scholar duel on yeah. Chekhov's shelf up there above the mantle. So, but but you're we'll right. See how that goes. You're right. It is kind of. It will be fun to go back and try to figure out who at what point in time is under the mask because that's part of the fun of rewatching Scream. Is trying to guess which person is currently Scream Three aside, which person is currently under the mask given the logistics and given the way that Ghostface moves around. Like sometimes the logistics don't necessarily sometimes match. Sometimes he has teleporting powers. Yeah, some that's And that's very just kind of what you work with with the Red Devil too. In, in any given slasher movie, you accept that a normal human being may or may not develop teleporting powers if they're homicidal wearing a mask and attempting to murder people. Yeah. But it, it just is, goes with the territory. It is really fun. Again, trying to guess who's under the mask at any given time when you know who the killers are. Oh, yeah. Like, it's kind of fun to go, that is totally Stu under the mask at this point. Go, well, this guy's a little bit more reserved. He's probably Billy. <clears throat> Flailing all around. That's definitely Stu. Yeah. You know? Any <laughs> Anything any, that gets subtitled with, let me love you as a gift. It's, it's that's Stu. probably Stu. Uh, and and then, you know, seeing somebody out of the mask and seeing them be red and sweaty and begging for help. It's like, ah, I see what you did there, movie, that sort of thing. That's so pretty smart. So once we watch the finale, it will be fun to go back and go, okay, it's this person yeah. here, it's this person here. Assuming they put that much thought and effort into the logistics of everything. We will see. It's a Ryan Murphy world. So that being said... You know, Pete comes clean to Grace about being a murderer, whether he's just meaning that he was complicit in certain in certain deaths, like not necessarily that he got his hands dirty, but that he w- he knew it was going to happen and he was complicit in it. He just calls himself a murderer and then the episode ends. And then the episode And ends. then we have a dialogue-free preview, so it's like, we don't need to show you anything for the preview. Just go. Do we want to talk uh, a little bit about whether or not Scream Queens talk about, you know, Grace and her agency was shown in a positive light, negative light, stereotypical light? I think that's the best discussion of consent that I've seen since the video about tea. And if you haven't seen the tea video, you need to watch it. I think I think it's British explaining consent as a cup of tea. Unconscious people do not want tea. She can say she wants tea and then decide she doesn't want it, and that does not mean that you can force the tea on her, even though you went through all the trouble of making it. Just, it explains it very well. Same applies to guys, of course. Of of course. Like, anyone. Unconscious people in general do not want tea. But this is one of the best discussions of... Well, first of all, for consent, she says, I'm not ready. And he just immediately... He's like, okay. I totally respect that. Just just let me know when. Let me know if you decide. Okay. Okay. Cool. Which is really good to see because that does not happen very often in popular media. And again, it's a Ryan Murphy world. So I kind of expect the worst when it comes to a lot of more sensitive issues. And... <laughs> You can't blame me. I watched two and a half seasons of Glee. Um, but her talk with her dad about whether or not I'm she's not ready. Sure if I'm ready. And him basically saying, you know, well, mine is really a worst case scenario, not going to lie. But if you're not ready, don't do it. Because if you're not ready and you do, nothing if, good can come of yeah, it. So it's, you, it's all up to you. Yeah, if you feel like you're not ready, you're probably not. Yeah. And that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So this is actually a very good, two very good discussions of some very, very touchy issues. And that wasn't something I was expecting Scream Queens to do. Yeah, no, that's that's a good discussion. I will say that, like, kind of not necessarily to counteract that, but, like, I will say that it does kind of make me... I, I think it's definitely a good discussion to have, and I like that the show makes those points. But just in terms of horror as a genre, like, in terms of 
kind of saying like, oh, she's the innocent one. Oh, she's the virgin. Let's so that means she's going to live. Like, uh, on the one hand, like, I do take a little bit of issue just with horror as a whole taking certain moral stances. Again, I think this was a very good discussion, though. Horror as a genre needs to progress a little bit more and need to, needs to be a little less antiquated in terms of the way that it talks about these certain things. But for this, even if it was a nod to the virgin's live trope, it was addressed extremely well. And again, I wasn't expecting that in a Ryan Murphy world. I We watched this episode twice, and I was pleasantly surprised the first time and found that it still held up the second. Yeah, it didn't so come off as very forced. Well it didn't come off as preachy either. And I think that's probably more important, especially when horror's key demographic is teenagers. So, and, you know, again, it's... Horror likes to have its cake and eat it, too. Uh, it likes to show people, you know... It likes to show people having sex and then also, you know, having violence enacted upon them. So it has this really weird, misconstrued morality, quote-unquote, but at the same time, it still has the TNA to cater to its demographic. So it's this really weird hodgepodge of mixed messages <laughs> in terms of he, like, again, it likes to have its cake and eat it too. So it's nice to actually have something go, hey guys, can we, can we have a real talk for a minute? I feel cool. like a lot Back of Back to that. our regularly scheduled program I without just, feeling like a PSA. I just feel like a lot of those tropes came from like 80s slasher movies. A lot. No, that that is, again, which I actually genuinely prefer those to like say what lots of 70s horror movies did in terms of attitudes towards women and everything like that. That's a discussion for another day. Yeah. So I would rather take Sluts Die, Virgins Live over what they did in the 70s. But that being said, that's not a good message either. No. Any, anywho. Virginity is a myth, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> the hymen doesn't work that way. <laughs> Adam ruins everything. It's Adam great. ruins everything. If you guys haven't watched Adam true. ruins everything, it's fantastic. But um, anyway... <laughs> The the point here being is that this it, it was I liked that this could have again a discussion like this without it coming off as forced or like a PSA. Yeah. To the point where she goes, maybe after we kill Dean Munch and he's like, Yeah, that kind of killed the mood for me, I'm out. <laughs> well, and he also he's putting her up on a pedestal. He with, is, and that's oh, not good no, either. You're good and pure and you're all of these wonderful things and you're trying to fight against this awful Greek system and if you kill Dean Munch, you'll become just like them and you'll be everything you were trying to fight against. And, and then like, I'll have to kill you. Pretty much. <laughs> that that was that was the implied bit there was, and then I'll have to kill you. Because that's like, she's fighting against Kappa House, and she's trying to make things better, and she's trying to do actual sisterhood, and therefore, she's pure and good, and the shining light in this dark, de like, dreary Greek organization. Have we had any attempts on Grace's life? Directly? Mm. No. We've None had... whatsoever. We had a couple. Uh, we had the tunnels for Zayde, and I don't know if we had another one after that. But no. Zayde got, you know, they kidnapped on the romancing with the Oakland nachos. It's, and the stuff it's like, like that. the killer yeah. was always a step behind Grace in terms of like going six hours and tracking down this person that Pete and Grace talked to. Um, that the second Zayde and Grace got separated, that's when Boone kidnapped Zayde. So, like, the. I feel like even though she's seen the killer and seen the aftermath of the killer, anytime she and the killer were present together, it was either somebody else was the victim or it was a show to get suspicion off of Gigi or to kidnap Zayde, you know, any number of things. Yeah. I think probably the closest was when they actually found the underground lair. Yeah. But even then, I don't feel like Grace was attacked directly. I don't. I don't think she was in the room. I think that was Gigi and uh, Denise. Yeah. Denise, thank you. And and again, that was mostly to kind of throw suspicion off of Gigi. Yes. 
So that was a hundred percent to throw suspicion. So off of you. yeah, even though Grace's sorority sisters have been dropping like fr- like flies in terms of Candle Girl and Sam, Def Taylor Swift, and all those other people that have been killed, and they actually rattle off the list of everybody who's died up to this point, which was very it's impressive. It's pretty wild. Um, like it's a long. It's extensive. List. So, but yeah, there was never there at least not to my knowledge there has never been a direct attempt on Grace's life. At least not one that wasn't staged in some way, shape, or form. So, again, I think, again, I don't think it's about her. I think it's about these individual people taking up the mantle of the Red Devil who each have their own agendas, whether it's taking down Kappa, cleaning up the Greek system as a whole, getting personal revenge. revenge. Yeah, it's, it's a number of things because every person who's worn the costume has their own personal agenda. To the point where one girl is totally okay stabbing her brother and adopted mother and killing them. like, And, and that's why I think when Pete says never call this number again and hangs up, that means he's next. Not yeah. only because he knows who the other person is, obviously, but because like, he's removing he, himself from the situation. He, ha- he, he seems to be having this like moral objection to any further action when the other person wants to take it further. So again, I still think it's Hester. That's just me. That's just my prediction. Any other thoughts? I'm I'm with you on that one. It almost seems like the obvious choice at this point, but it's what we have. It's what we have. I, I can't see it being anybody else except maybe Chanel number five, who the first time I watched it, it looks like she put down the phone intentionally and then made yeah. a big scene intentionally. But at the same time, the second time I watched it, it seemed more natural. But that being said, the only way I could see that happening is if at some point she was looped out of a conversation or was only looped into it after a certain point. And it makes no sense that way. Yeah, I, she's, I don't know. I, don't, I, I genuinely think she's like stupid like a fox in the same way that Chanel number three is, but I don't think she's a killer. That's just me personally. Anywho, yeah. that's it uh, for this week's. So we're going to sit down and watch the finale whenever we get a chance. At some point soon. Katie, where can the people find you? You can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Kiaxe. That's K-I-A-X-E-T. You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the Mingwen. That's T-H-E-M-E-N-G-U-I-N. Be sure to follow uh, Silver Screams on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All that fun stuff. It's going to be a good time. Um, getting ready for the holidays. Yeah. So, yeah, just really excited that the holidays are coming up. And if you guys haven't seen Krampus already, I wrote a review on the moviechick.com. So that's chick with two Ks. Be sure to check that out if you guys I'm are curious. I'm not going to see it. <laughs> it's not your thing. It's not my thing. Anywho, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We will see you all next time.